As well as its brilliant sound, Marilyn Horne's voice is known for its extraordinary range. Her career, too, has spanned everything from grand opera to light entertainment. How about a few laughs? To pirate recordings of pop singles. She's been most associated with the work of the composer Rossini and was the first non-Italian ever to win the coveted Rossini medal honouring her as the greatest singer in the world. When she gave her last performance of a Rossini opera at Cotton Garden last year, we decided to use the opportunity to look back over her long career. Marilyn Horne lives in New York, where for the past 25 years she's been one of the leading stars of the Metropolitan Opera. For its centenary celebration, the Met mounted its first Handel opera, Rinaldo, in her honour. The New York Times selected the 10 greatest voices of the 20th century. Marilyn Horne was the only living singer chosen. It was her work with Joan Sutherland in the bel canto operas of composers such as Rossini, Donizetti and Bellini that first brought her major stardom in the mid-1960s. Everybody was talking about her, appearing with Joan Sutherland, and knocking people off their pins. When you go to something and you're, you know what you're going to hear, you're going to hear Dame Joan, and she's a known qual uh, quality. And then you walk in, and then there's this little sawed-off thing there that's uh, opening up her mouth. And people were just, I mean, it, it, they were really floored.
Unfortunately, no record exists of the original production of Bellini's Norma. It was their debut at the Metropolitan Opera House and caused a sensation. It marked a watershed in the revival of international interest in the bel canto repertoire. And something quite special happened when they sang these Bellini, bel canto, beautiful singing uh, 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 duets. And that's really what bel canto means, is that the, that, that the music that was, that was written for it was essentially there in order to show off the singing of the artist, to show off the beautiful voice, to show off the beautiful skills and techniques of using that voice, and therefore bel, bel canto. The interest really started because of Maria Callas, and then in very short order, Joan Sutherland. And, but these women singing these soprano roles must have a lady to sing the seconda donna, let's say, or the leading male, as it were, most of the times, because I got to play the young warrior or whatever who um, is in love with the soprano, uh, gets her or doesn't get her, doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, so they had to have a partner. And uh, I seem to fit that bill. There's still that, that certain e explosion of, of, of sound when, when the, the two voices, the two types of voices come together. But it's just that, that, that I, I think Marilyn's and my voice did sort of blend so fantastically and it created a, a certain, I think probably a certain standard. <laughs> who pretty much discovered that I was trying to sing. Within a few months, I was already singing, and uh, they say my big showpiece at a year and a half was walking in the winter wonderland. <laughs> Many times on the television, they'll be giving the weather report, and they will say, and the coldest spot in the nation tonight is Bradford, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and this is five years old in the snow of Bradford. It was a very bustling little town. I would say that um, the whole Protestant American work ethic is definitely there in the background. But I think I owe an awful lot of that to my mother because my mother was a, what we call a workaholic, and I got that uh, syndrome from her. I'm about a year and a half old here with my sister, and these beads that I'm wearing, my mother told me that they were wooden beads that I wouldn't part with. I had to wear them at all times. So the prima donna was already rearing her head. And at three or four, I'm not quite sure which, I sang for this, uh, democratic picnic and rallying support for FDR. By then I was singing in church. And um, from that time on, I sang in public a lot. It was depression time in the United States of America. And her father was uh, a shoe salesman, I think, at the time. And, but with a wonderful voice. He knew what it took somehow to make the, this kind of a life in music. And uh, he um, cajoled and yelled and uh, uh, said, you know, you should do this, you should do that. This man was strict. He was a disciplinarian with her and her voice. And uh, she was a rebel. And he really, uh, in my opinion, probably instilled that kind of need to do it 
and to do it well in her. Given her own druthers, she would have gone out and played baseball or football with the kids. Yes, interception. <laughs> My father, he said to me, the only thing, remember, if you ever think you're getting too good for the guy sitting next to you, it's only a little piece of gristle in your throat that separates the two of you. Strike up the music, the band has begun. The Pennsylvania Polka. My sister by then was singing, and then it became the Horn Sisters. And so all of the engagements that my father had to sing now started to turn over to his daughters, and he loved that a lot. He was extremely proud of that, I know. And we had these band concerts in various locations throughout the town. And uh, of course, the main one was the public square. We were always singing. I would certainly say that I learned how to sing duets. <laughs> I would say that I certainly know how to sing with another person, how to listen, how to tune up together, how to make sure instantly what the other person is doing. If somebody is suddenly singing softer or louder, being absolutely attuned to what is going on, putting on consonants at the same time, all of that kind of thing. It's, it's just one of those things that, that's something like a, a spark or almost like, like magic, that, that uh, when, you, when you hear the, the sound of the other voice, it's just some sort of magical blending. in tune with each other. And I think it's not, not only vocal, but, um, but I think it also is musical uh, and expressive intention. Dinner in the diner, nothing could be finer than to have your ham and eggs in Carolina. <laughs> when the whistle's blowing, something ain't to, to the, the bar. bar, then you know the Tennessee is not very far. far. Shovel all the colon, gotta keep it rolling. Woo, Chad, and who could there you are. There's going to be oh, wow. a certain party at the station. Wee wee! <laughs> the wheel of fortune. I, when I was 11, almost 12, the family moved to Long Beach, California, and uh, was uh, obviously uh, very, very different. Uh, we went into, of course, good weather. <laughs> And it was certainly a, a golden place. That's a good word for it, the golden state. <laughs> People don't think of California so much as the golden state anymore, but it truly, truly was. Here you have this girl who is raised in Bradford, like a little Puritan almost. Then she gets out there where it's, well, come on, let's go swimming. Surf's up. She really is a Midwesterner who's had a patina of uh, California put on her, and it's a very interesting mixture. Oh my, oh my, oh my. That's terrific. You look Did we sing a lot down at one of the hotels on the waterfront? Yeah, we did a duet, and then you'd do a solo, and then I would do a solo. 
right? Something or like so, that. Yeah. yeah. And then we do another. And then we go back to school. We we go back to class. We But the now three of us were together in a cappella choir. Well, I sat up next there. to Gloria the first semester. Right. She and I were sitting next to you in the alto. First section. alto, right? Yeah. And I was in the soprano section. Yeah. So I remember that you were always getting in trouble for talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing's changed. <laughs> This, this looks more like the Long Beach I knew, certainly, which is very, very different than now. Oh yes, here is the old Rainbow Pier, and then the famous Cyclone Racer, which is a great roller coaster, which was at this amusement park here called the Pike. That was one of my passions. Baby's coming home. We are coming upon St. Luke's Episcopal Church right here on the left. Uh, the, the choir here was rather famous, and I guess my dad must have found out in short order where to take us to sing. The uh, choir director named um, William Ripley Dorr, he became our voice teacher. And uh, I remember he just really frowned upon the fact that we would sing pop music on occasion. At one time, we were doing some kind of radio shows, and uh, we were so afraid he'd find out about it, we changed our name to the Hudson Sisters instead of the Horn Sisters. <laughs> when I was about 18, a new friend was doing these recordings, and they paid $40 a session or something like that, which was, you know, sounded awfully good. Because I've had this ability to mimic voices, I was able to take the big hits of the day, which is what those pirate companies did, be it K-Star, be it Peggy Lee, I would try to imitate their voices. A gypsy with a crystal ball to gaze in. Because a guy is a guy wherever he may be. So listen and I'll tell you what this family did to me. Be anything. And those were put out in supermarkets um, for about 50 cents. By this time, Horn was also making legitimate recordings as a member of the Roger Wagner Chorale. Their distinctive sound helped characterize American television of the time. They also contributed to a revival of interest in American folk music. What about Law to the Nativity? That was done on location. Oh, That was yeah. done on location to Goldwyn. Right. But in here we did folk songs of the New World. Thank you, LAPD. <laughs> but in, okay, here we go. <laughs> Roger always wanted his women to sound like boys sopranos. Light and airy. His Catholic training. <laughs> Remember, the ones I contracted would be about 12 of you women and about 24, 36 men. Exactly. You bet. Right. The old overtone system. <laughs> it was quite a lot of fun. Though. Yeah. Great oh, experiences. Yeah. He's gone away for to stay a little while. But he's coming if he goes ten thousand miles, look away, look away over yon road. Oh, Pappy.
but we were doing the background music for what, it, uh, you know, we didn't even call them sitcoms then. I Married Joan by that wonderful American comedian, Joan Davis. And uh, instead of having an orchestra as the background music, they used a chorus. And it was Roger's people. Horn's ability to mimic found her work as a voice double, most famously in Carmen Jones, Oscar Hammerstein's Deep South version of Bizet's Carmen. The film starred Dorothy Dandridge and was directed by Otto Preminger. I knew Herschel Gilbert fairly well. He was the music director on, on, um, for Preminger on the, the film Carmen Jones, which was, was coming up. And uh, he was hiring singers and chorus and, and uh, so forth, and they didn't have anybody for um, Cindy Lou, which was not the Carmen part, but the, the, the ingenue role, so to speak, in the part of Carmen. And uh, I said, well, you have to listen to this friend of mine, Jackie Horn. I sang at that audition Michaela's aria in French and still didn't realize quite what was going on there. But I heard these, a lot of these women, young women uh, of all ages, sort of singing the famous habanera, which I had never sung, but obviously knew in my ear and, and certainly could read that, uh, uh, in with the Hammerstein lyrics. Which in, in Carmen Jones is, love's a baby that grows up wild. And she started imitating, while well, she thought Dandridge would sing it or Carmen Jones would sing it, and he said, hey, that's terrific, we don't have a Carmen. And within a couple of days, I was cast to, to do that. And uh, I was 20 years old at the time, and it was just, um, I suppose, um, a lot of moxie that got me there, and uh, the fact that I can imitate a lot of voices. Love's a baby that grows up wild, and he don't do what you want him to. Love ain't nobody's angel child, and he won't pay any mind to you. People say, boy, has your voice changed. And I won't give him a cigarette. I was a lighter voice, but I was trying to imitate her voice. And all I got that man can get That's love That's love That's love That's love You go for me and I'm taboo But if you're hard to get a go for you And if I do, then you are through, boy my baby, that's the end of you. World War II sent an awful lot of refugees to the United States from the cultural world, from the musical world especially. So our symphony orchestras, our music schools, and our orchestras in the film studios were peppered and salted with all of these fabulous musicians. And this cultural life was really active there, and, and I became a part of it at, at a very young age, in my late teens. This is one of the houses where Stravinsky lived. We used to rehearse here, and I'm meeting my friend Grace Ingle, who was one of the fellow singers. Oh, you oh. remember that? Mm-hmm. Here we are, young and innocente. Was with uh, the music of Stravinsky, one really had to count. Oh, yes. <laughs> not only did you count, not only did you learn to control the quality of your voice, but you did things with it you never thought you could do. Right, right. Like he would want things that were harsh yes. or biting. Do you remember? Mm, he, sure. he liked that in a voice. Right. Musically, for musicianship, nothing could have been a better teacher and more horrifying either. But right, I mean, it was right. frightening. Yes. I think that all of that, I always say, that went back here into this big tape recorder. Mm -hmm. And somehow mm -hmm. I, I pull things out all the time when I need them and I sort of don't, don't even know maybe where it came from, but some experience is back here that really has paid off in my later career. Stravinsky, who dedicated his last work to Horn, was among those who advised her to go to Europe to further her ambition as an opera singer. Well, I spent... Um three years in the Gelsenkirchen 
municipal opera in Germany. If one really wanted to be a singer of the leading roles, you had to, to go and experience what it was like to get through a leading role. This is a production of La Boheme that I was in. Mimi, a role that I loved singing very, very much. My, my most famous week at Gelsenkirchen was in 1958, I believe it was. Yes, I think. Yes, 58. Um, I had a week of from hell, actually, but I didn't know it at the time. On Monday, I sang Julietta in The Tales of Hoffman. On Tuesday, I sang Minnie in The Girl of the Golden West. On Wednesday, Julietta. On Thursday, Minnie. On Friday, Julietta. On Saturday, Minnie. And on Sunday, I sang Julietta twice. <laughs> and the last opera that was on my schedule there was Wozzeck. And the reason why I say it was the last opera was because I chose not to renew my contract because I was getting married. And um, going back to Los Angeles to get married to Henry Lewis. My mother was very much against the marriage because um, Henry is black. In 1960, that was a very, very big deal to have a mixed marriage. And my mother was by then a widow and she truly, I think, felt that her world was going to come crashing around her shoulders. And so she did not come to the wedding. But I consider that Henry really put together the final years of vocal study. He did great um, delving and seeking and reading and writing cadenzas and uh, really, really working hard. Marilyn had an enormous natural gift, but she also had an, a, 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 a tremendous ability to work and to try to improve. And I think that's always the answer of someone who is who is is truly great. It's it's on it's on on top of a of an enormous gift, to then have the ability to to work and and cultivate. And she worked, and we cultivated a, a technique that stood in her instead for what what is it forty five years now? She's been, you know, the career was a, was that long, which is extremely unusual, as you know. Oh, <laughs> 
Marilyn Horne's greatest contribution to music has been in developing and popularising the mezzo-soprano repertoire of composers such as Rossini. On her return to America in 1960, she first married the conductor Henry Lewis, a marriage which lasted 14 years and gave Horne a daughter, Angela. Then she starred in the soprano role of Marie in Alban Berg's 1925 opera, Wojciech. That's the uh, Bible scene from Wozzeck, where she sings Marie. That was like the, 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 the change in her career. Because she, she first did it in Gelsenkirchen, but it was the first thing that she was invited to sing in Berlin and Frankfurt, and she started making a guest. And eventually, she was invited to San Francisco to sing Marie. Uh, and incidentally, uh, in the same season, she sang uh, um, Nedda in Pagliacci and, and Musetta and, and uh, all those other roles that uh, 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 were essentially associated with sopranos. In my day, we were trained, as I said, like boy sopranos. And um, then with puberty arrived this other whole octave. An octave is eight notes, right? Uh, on the bottom of my voice, which meant that I suddenly had this lower voice, which I did nothing to achieve. It just arrived because now I was so-called young woman. And, um, but I still continued to sing soprano. So the soprano is the higher range and the more brilliant quality of the female voices. And the mezzo-soprano is exactly what it is, half soprano, <laughs> which means it's half soprano and therefore does not maybe go up quite as high as the sopranos sing and then gets down into a an even lower register than the sopranos, but predominantly sings in the middle part of the voice and should have a quality of sound that will say goes more towards a woodwind sound of an oboe rather than the woodwind sound of a flute. When she had been a soprano, the lower and middle had this rich gift, and then the upper voice that she sang with in Gelsenkirchen in those days when she sang soprano parts, the upper voice was something different, was narrower and, and, and smaller. But she found that in, by singing these mezzo parts where she didn't have to stay in the high tessitura, she could develop the upper register from that middle register, and with that same dark quality, and the trick, of course, is to do that without losing any brilliance and without losing a, a, a force, which took us some time of, 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 of daily practicing and exercises. One is, not a, you know, one, one is not accustomed to hearing a voice of that size, being able to move, have the flexibility that she has. I think that is what has made her unique. I mean, you, you, used to, you think of, of, of a coloratura voice, you think of a much lighter sound. But when you hear Marilyn, you hear the size of this voice and the, and the fact that she, that it, it moves so it was such ease. It's uh, that's that's what really has separated her from everybody. <laughs> I got the nickname General Horn because of all of these roles that I have played where I have been the general of the army. And there have been many, Arsace, Tancredi, Orlando, Orlando Furioso, Rinaldo, 
and so on. That's General Horn. <laughs> and I really hadn't planned on doing that at all. It's just that I could do it, and it was comfortable. Although I was truly terrified the first time I sang Semiramide, because that's the lowest and probably the heaviest of all of these big contralto coloratura roles. That means low voice, predominant singing, low and middle voice with agility. You really have to be able to move your voice fast. Engaged, uh, or actually asked to sing Semiramide in 1964 for the first time and in order to um, find out if I could sing it we had to find a, find a score and unfortunately the only place the score existed was at the Los Angeles Public Library. Unfortunately it never got back to the library. but it turned out to be the role that really launched me into a different orbit. It's great to be back here after all these years, and I think it's about time after 30 years that I present the library with a new score of Rossini to replace the one that I sort of took out of here 30 years ago. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. There's the Tarantella of Rossini. You know, most people know this piece, but they don't know Rossini wrote it. You know, <laughs> Well, this one's very interesting. This is um, part of the, the Semirana. Oh, well, of course, this is especially interesting to me. Oh, there it is. Bum, 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 bum. This is the my entrance. For the past 30 years, Marilyn Horne has been at the top of her profession in the United States. She's combined appearances on the opera stage and concert platform with popular TV shows such as The Odd Couple and here on The Carol Burnett Show. Outside your door, which it only makes a person gladly, what you even more, I could understand a person 
If it's not a person's bag, I think it's um, exposing an operatic diva, so as it were, to another public. And it makes, I think, perhaps it makes uh, um, opera singers seem um, a little more um, relaxed, down to earth, and maybe somebody in those millions of people that are watching television will say, well, now listen, if, if, she, if she's in opera, maybe opera isn't so bad. Maybe I'll go hear an opera one of these days. And I, I think that's part of it, that, that enormous exposure that one has on television. She has, has been here over, over those 30 years and sustained the, 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 the performances that she has. She's not only sung um, these, these wonderful um, revivals of, of the Rossini works, but she's been a great recital singer as well. She's done very varied programs and done concerts and recitals endlessly. She's just a great artist. opportunities to perform recitals have dried up or are drying up. So we, some friends and I got together and decided to form the Marilyn Horn Foundation, which is to try to perpetuate and increase the amount of recitals that are given in the United States. And the logical time to sort of put some focus on this foundation was the 60th birthday, which fell on January 16th this year, 1994. And uh, we took Carnegie Hall. And I invited some of my most illustrious colleagues to participate in the concert. <laughs> From the Metropolitan Opera, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marilyn Horn. I count myself among those who have been moved and inspired by your extraordinary talent. Another highlight of Horn's career was to sing at the inauguration of President Clinton in 1993. A fervent campaigner on his behalf, she's been involved with the Democratic Party since her early performances as a young child at the Roosevelt Bond rallies. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. You can take pride in your contributions to music's past as well as to its future. You have touched many lives in the course of your distinguished career, and I'm pleased to applaud you for a lifetime of great achievements. Sincerely, Bill Clinton. <laughs> Horn regularly holds masterclasses. Vendetta. Great word, vendetta. Yeah. Manevro, manevro, vendetta. That's a great word, vengeance. 
She believes passionately in the correct training of younger singers. Okay, great word, and don't, don't go over it. That's all mm -hmm. I want. Manero. Uh, hey. Right there? Manero. I think that it. needs a little more, little more, more cupo yeah, on yeah. it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is determined to pass on the knowledge and skills that she's acquired. Truly, what singing is all about is breath support. And it's, it's literally breathing. As you inhale, this part of your body, we'll call it the diaphragm for want of a, a better word, because this is larger than the whole time, extends. And you just gently keep it out there. Just keep pushing it out there. And then gradually you engage the muscles in the, in the back, which help to support it. And the stomach muscles, the buttocks muscles, the legs, everything comes into play because as you're trying to hold on to a note or sing a long phrase you need more and more air so you just keep pushing this out and all these muscles are doing lots of the work I learned my breath support when I was a little girl in Bradford, Pennsylvania. I think I couldn't have been more than about eight or nine years old, and that is the basis of the support I have used for the rest of my life. You know, this is also some, not, a lot of it's not easy because um, why are we doing this? Because I have arrived at a place in my life that what I've done um, has been good enough to be celebrated in some way. So that also means that I'm getting old. <laughs> 